This is Wordsworth in 1806, and this is the famous Edridge portrait. And Wordsworth in 1806, in, 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 in this period, 1806, 1807, he is 36 years old, and he is seeing through the press his important volume, the poems in two volumes, 1807. So 1798, as we'll see, is the year of the first edition of the local ballads. 1807 is the year of the poems in two, in two volumes. In those years in between, Wordsworth had written three versions of his poetic autobiography, The Prelude. Wordsworth says, and this is a joke, Wordsworthian jokes might not be funny to everyone, but he says, it is a thing remarkable in literary history for a man to talk so much about himself and selfhood and himself is so important in words. Not for nothing is his most famous poem, I Wandered a Lonely as a Cloud. So the, the notion of selfhood is really important. So here's Wordsworth in 1806. Uh, my old tutor, Jonathan Wordsworth, who was uh, descended from Christopher Wordsworth, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, used to say it was a great shame for Wordsworthian studies, though not, of course, for William Wordsworth that he didn't die in 1807, because basically the whole of his masterpieces, the, 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 the entire uh, oeuvre of, of, of masterworks, lyrical ballads, 1788, 1798, 1800, the three first forms of the prelude, 1799, 1804, 1805, the poems in two volumes are all written. So if words had gone under an omnibus or uh, fallen off a, off a cliff in the Lake District, then we would see him as a lost leader in a very different way than Browning's conception of the lost leader. Browning writes that kind of scoffing sonnet about the Tory placeman, William Wordsworth. But if he died in 1807, then we would see him as a tremendously, a, a great lost radical poet. Uh, so Wordsworth, uh, di if he died in, 18, in 1807, we would not have seen his conversion to Toryism, his work as a government sinecurist and place, uh, placeman, and his appointment to follow his friend Southey as Poet Laureate, Queen Victoria's first Poet Laureate, in 1843. So, so John, here he is at, at, at sort of 36, 37. Yeah. Um, and and with hindsight, there's this sense of, of 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 him already having peaked. But in in his own, uh, um, I mean, where is he getting his money from at this point? You 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 said he was an orphan uh, tragically at thirteen, yep. um, but he has an uncle who uh, ensures that he gets a good education. Okay. Uh, how how do we get from there to to here in terms of of, of uh, um, Let's have a look at the next couple of slides then, and they will tell, they will help us understand that story. Oh no, maybe, maybe, maybe we should, um, maybe we should come back to this poem in a minute, uh, because I think it's very, very pertinent. So we think of Wordsworth as the, uh, the great poet of the Lake District, and he, of course he is indeed, uh, though it has to be said that much of his most important work has done Near in, in this neck of the woods, in the West Country, in Dorset and in Somerset and in Bristol, where he first meets the radical young poet, S.T. Courage. So this is, Wordsworth is the poet of Grasmere, and this is where he lives uh, in some of the very peak years of his, uh, of his maturity, from 1799 for a decade or so. Next slide. So this is the famous Dove Cottage Grasmere that was um, at the center of the creativity of, of Wordsworth from December in 1799 for a decade or so, when the tenancy was taken up by the infamous and uh, extraordinary figure of Thomas de Quincey, the English opium eater, an early admirer of Wordsworth's work. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did he get from here? his birthplace to the poet of, eight, uh, of 1836, okay? Uh, Wordsworth was born in, the, in, in, this, in, in this, this house, in Cockermouth, in the, in the Lake District. And um, Pevsner, in his book on Cumbria, says that this is the only swank house in the town. In, in, in the town. It's the biggest house in the town. It's owned by Wicked Jimmy Lonsdale, and it is given to, uh, to rent-free, to his acolyte, John Wordsworth, and Wordsworth lives there for the first eight years of his life, the biggest house in town. Next slide, please. And perhaps more important is what's at the back of the house, the River Derwent. And Wordsworth is um, a great devotee of the Lake District, and he is fashioned by his childhood in the lakes, in Cockermouth, 
in Hawkshead, in Grasmere, Wind, Windermere, Ambleside. But it's that river that casts its nurse's voice through his song that he returns to time and time again in his work. And it's a great moment of poetic extinction for Wordsworth in 1798 that paradoxically brings him back to here. It is a thing unprecedented in, in literary history for a man to talk so much about himself. Harold Bloom said that Wordsworth is the first poet in the English tradition to talk almost exclusively about selfhood and Wordsworthian preoccupation with the creative imagination, with a sense of poetic genius, of poets as being, in a sense, possessed of a special form of insight. He's fashioned here in the Lake Districts. He says that he's, he was fashioned alike by beauty and by fear. In the prelude, he talks about his experiences in the Lake District, the warm and nurturing side of the Lake District, but also slightly more terrifying moments in his um, youthful career. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, before we come to 1806, we have to take into account Samuel Taylor Coleridge, from Ottery St. Mary in the, uh, in, in the southwest of England. Extraordinary genius, Christian divine, great poet, the author of the scintillating rhyme of the ancient mariner. And those of you who have been following the uh, big read, these ancient mariner big read, uh, uh, will have enjoyed it tremendously. If you've not seen it, do have a look at the Plymouth University, Barsbar University, Ancient Mariner Big Read. It's a remarkable thing. So here's Coleridge, uh, and he meets Wordsworth in Bristol in 1795. We don't know where, because the, story, the, stories, the stories vary. Um, one, of, uh, one of Wordsworth's uh, friends said that uh, Coleridge uh, was was, 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 um, came along to a talk given by Wordsworth on radical politics in uh, Bristol in 1795. Others said that they corresponded because Coleridge was an admirer of the first volumes of uh, Wordsworth's uh, Maturity, so, uh, An Evening Walk and Descriptive Sketches of 1793. Who knows? But these two men got together and were friends and partners over the next decade or so. Next slide, please. So Coleridge is one of the most remarkable figures in the English literary tradition, but he was capable of uh, <laughs> genuflecting to Wordsworth in a very remarkable way. A very great man, the only man to whom at all times, in all moods of excellence, I feel myself inferior. <laughs> For the London literati appear to me to be very much like little potatoes, i.e. no great things, a compost of nullity and dullity. So these remarkable men, uh, corresponded and worked together. So um, Wordsworth is living in Racedown in North Dorset, near the uh, border with West Somerset, and Coleridge and his new wife, Sarah, moved to the hamlet of Nether Stowey so that they can walk together. So that's about 10 miles distance. So they see each other every day and they plan on writing a volume of poetry, The Lyrical Ballads, published by Joseph Cottle in Bristol in uh, 1798, then uh, um, enlarged in two volumes, probably by Longman in London in this period. So in this period, the 1790s, Wordsworth is an enthusiastic radical. We all know that famous line of his from the Pelude when he's talking about the French Revolution. He is at St. John's College, Cambridge, and he says, this was it in that door, to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. So Wordsworth wants to see the French Revolution at first hand. So in 1791, he walks to Paris with his friend Robert Jones, and they see the revolution at first hand. He meets and falls for a French maiden, Annette Bayon. Uh, she gives birth to their child in 1792. The war which breaks out the following year between France and England uh, rather does for that relationship. So Wordsworth does not see a a Annette or his daughter Caroline for several years until the Peace of Amiens in, 18, uh, in, in 1802. So he is reunited at this period with his sister Dorothy, who'd been living with relatives in Yorkshire. And they're remarkably close, remarkably close. 
uh, and uh, so between this fellowship between himself and his daughter uh, sorry and his, his sister Dorothy with whom he lives for the remaining 56 years of his life and Coleridge with whom he's working really closely there is this great poetic splurge of, uh, of, of verse so the lyrical ballads of 1798 a pioneering work in English literature one which changed the terrain of English poetry the next slide please Okay, so this is um, this is a, a, a kind of um, I'm not sure if I can see all the words because of uh, the um, some of the things at the side. I, 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 yeah, so please bear with me if I missed the occasional word. Here. Catherine Clarkson is the new wife of the famous Thomas Clarkson, who is a friend or <laughs> the friend of the great William Wilberforce. Um, the Wilberforces were close with the um, Clarksons, and of course with uh with um, words with uncle william who was uh, an anti-slavery uh, anti-slavery divine the fellow of st john's college Cambridge. so anyway here is mrs clarkson uh, thomas has taken a house in the lake district to rest from his his labors and this is a letter which has a kind of rather charming take on Wordsworth and Coleridge as young men paying their uh, respects to Thomas Clarkson, the great hero of anti-slavery after Wilberforce. I must tell you that we had a visit from Coleridge and W. Wordsworth, who spent a whole day with us. Coleridge was in high spirits and talked a great deal. Wordsworth more reserved, but there was neither her turn nor moroseness in his reserve. He is a fine commanding figure, he's rather handsome, and looks as if he were born to be a great prince or a great general. He seems very fond of Coleridge, laughing at his jokes and taking all opportunities of showing him off and to crown all, he has the manners of a gentleman. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, so here is, the, here, here is their, their collection. Wordsworth doesn't have a regular job until after the Napoleonic Wars, when he becomes a kind of uh, a, a collector of stamps uh, sorry he, he becomes a kind of tax tax man collecting duties on uh, on various things in particular the, the the mail but this is because he has an inheritance from his friend um, Railsley Calvert in 1895 of 900 pounds which is a considerable sum in uh, in, in in the mid 1790s so he's able to live because of the generosity of his doomed friend Rainsley. Now uh, Wordsworth even when before he had published anything of note seemed to be able to instill this extraordinary kind of respect and admiration in great people in Thomas de Quincey and S.D. Coleridge and so on. They all thought there was something truly remarkable about him. So here is this pop, this volume, Lyrical Ballads, with a few other poems. It starts with S.D. Coleridge's A Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It finishes with Wordsworth's great prose uh, meditation, Tintin Abbey, five years have passed, by summers and the length of five long winters, and so on and so on. So a really pivotal book in the history of English literature, as I'll uh, explain later on. So, so John, so uh, 1798, I mean, for anybody who uh, um, teaches English literature, uh, 1798 is one of those, uh, those years that we, 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 we all know. It's seen as a, a, a great uh, uh, watershed moment because of the publication of, of lyrical ballads. And, and, and I know when I teach this, or used to teach this to, to students, it was, it was quite difficult for them to realise quite how radical uh, uh, this collection was trying to be. I mean, it's one of the things when you look back from from our uh, vantage point now, uh, um, where Wordsworth and Coleridge are pretty uh, uh, central to uh, the uh, uh, the Romantic canon. That it's difficult to 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 get a, a, an immediate sense of of what's new and and different about this this poem and you or this collection. And you mentioned also that. Um, Wordsworth, although he hadn't published much at that point, um, had been able to command great kind of uh, respect from 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 other literary uh, figures. So, could you perhaps say a little bit about what uh, um, what is so important about this collection and what what Wordsworth brought to it um, that, uh, uh, that 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 makes it so important? Okay, well, um, I think, can I come at this in two? two different ways. Um, first of all, in terms of the poems themselves, 
And second, in terms of the literary theory which Wordsworth appends to it in the second edition of the local ballads in 1800 in the famous preface. Now, Wordsworth is generally, Byron, when Wordsworth, Lord Byron, when Wordsworth uh, was a Tory turncoat, uh, scoffs at Wordsworth as a man who seasoned his peddler poems with democracy. So the great left-wing Jacobin uh, writer of the 1790s ends up as a Tory pensioner and um, devotee of Lord Liverpool and Castlereagh and the other ranks of the Tory establishment in the 1810s and 1820s. But Wordsworth is a radical. Wordsworth is in favour of the French Revolution to begin with, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. He adopts many radical positions. He's a very strong devotee of the abolitionist, uh, abolition of the slave trade. He is a believer in the rights of man. Now the local ballads uh, are peppered with poems about people who do not feature much in English literature hitherto. So I mean gypsies, and old men traveling, the rural poor, the dispossessed, the lunatic, in inverted commas, and their experience. You know, Lewis Carroll, when he you know, takes the, the what's it out of words within, through the looking glass, has the, the, red, you know, the red knight. I, 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 I shook him, I, 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 I shook I, he, what's he, he grabs the man's throat and says, uh, I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Can tell me how you live? I cried, and what is it you do? So this notion of the poet walking down the country lane and meeting a gypsy girl or a blind beggar or, or you know, a people who are poor and dispossessed is new. So Wordsworth is writing a consciously radical poetry in the lyrical ballad. Coleridge is joining him, and they are seen as dangerous radicals. When they are living in the West Country, they are spied upon by the British Tory government of William Pitt. There's a famous story about Wordsworth and Coleridge talking about Spinoza and the, the government report of a spy said uh, they must be spies because they, they were heard talking about Spinoza. Anyway, uh, so this is a radical form of poetry. Can, I, can we look at the next slide please? So here is uh, here, here are one of the, the, the lyrical ballads. I haven't chosen one of the more famous works works of Wordsworth, um, none of the poems of lyrical ballads or 1807, but one that's pretty neglected, but I think it gives us a, a clear sense of what Wordsworth is about here. The Reverie of Poor Susan. Now Susan is a dairy maid who's ended up in the big city and thinks back to her life in the Lake District. When Charles Lamb uh, read this poem, he was rather shocked. And he, say, he wrote to, uh, to S.T. Courage, he said, I, I fear that poor Susan is, quote, no better than she ought to be. In other words, uh, she's a prostitute. Okay, so let's read The Reverie of Poor Susan, 1797. At the corner of Wood Street, where daylight appears, hangs a thrush that sings loud. It has sung for three years. Poor Susan has passed by the spot and has heard, in the silence of morning, the song of the bird. Tis a note of enchantment. What ails her? She sees a mountain ascending, a vision of trees. Bright volumes of vapour through Lothbury glide, and a river flows on through the vale of Cheapside. Green pastures she views in the midst of the dale, down which she so often has tripped with her pail, and a single small cottage, a nest like a dove's, the only one dwelling on earth that she loves. She looks and her heart is in heaven, but they fade. The mist and the river, the hill and the shade, the stream will not flow, and the hill will not rise, and the colours have all passed away from her eyes. Now this notion is that the voice of the poor, the dispossessed, of the beggar, the gypsy, the whore, is worthy of respect, is something new. In English poetry. The rural poor appear in the pastorals of Alexander Pope and elsewhere of course but generally it's eternal sunshine and uh, the cold realities of rural life are not often addressed. So Wordsworth is doing new things. He says in the preface to the local ballads, can we turn to the next slide, 
One after that, please. And again, here we are. Right. So these are these are almost too famous <laughs> to, to quote. I mean, so Wordsworth in eighteen in 1800, Wordsworth um, kind of, um, contrives to have Coleridge, shall we say, absent from the second collection, and writes a preface to the local ballads, which is, if you like, his take on where poetry should be. Now, uh, quite often when po poetry poets write manifestos, they say they're talking about what poetry is but actually they're talking about what it should be. So in the preface to the local ballads, words to say is this, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. The spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. This is something new and something remarkable in English poetry. The mimetic, in other words, the mirroring model of neoclassical poetry, such as that of Dr. Johnson, back to Dryden and Pope, argues that literature does two things. It holds up a mirror, it's mimetic, to the world, and it should copy ancient forms, especially the great classics of the Greek and Roman ages. After all, what better, better models should they be to copy? But here are words of encourage, copying slightly the earthier models of me medieval balladry and so on, and talking about poetry in this expressive way, which is something new in English poetry. Poetry should use the plain language of men. And Wordsworth takes uh, the po poet Thomas Gray to task for his use of overly complicated poetic diction, as Wordsworth calls it. So in other words, instead of saying, uh, talking about a sheep, you would say a member of the woolly tribe. So that kind of parenthetical, um, periphrastic vision, Wordsworth objects to. So he is talking about the language of the poor, he, uh, language of the rural poor, the real language of men. So trying to throw the voice or, and to give a voice to a radical, um, in a radical way to the poor. Now this, this is the kind of thing he illustrates in that very famous poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. Which, after all, is a is a, is not a stale poem when you think about it as uh, as it might, might first appear. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats and high over fields and hills, and all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. So he saw the daffodils uh, by the lake, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. But what happens later on? For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with sorrow, uh, sorry, with pleasure, pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So this is this uh, notion of how poetry works encapsulated in that poem. Now the way in which the average writer of poetry in the last hundred years has written is a deep, uh, is a kind of deeply Wordsworthian way. If you go to a, a kind of creative writing group at Bath Spire University, you say, what's the point of, of writing verse? Very often people will say, it is to express your feelings. And that is a Wordsworthian, Coleridgean, Byronic, Keatsian, romantic way of looking at the world, that poetry should be about one's own feelings. Wordsworth is capable of writing great narrative poetry, but his core cool subject, was himself. He writes uh, verse autobiography, the prelude, uh, which is longer than Milton's Paradise Lost. And it only takes our hero from <laughs> Cockermouth to Cambridge University. Next slide. Is that the direction you want me to go, John? I, I, yeah, I don't know. That, that, let's, let's go to that direction because time is, time is marching on. I mean, okay, so, um, in, in 1798, in uh, the coldest winter of the 18th century, Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy are living in Goslar in Saxony. And um, Esty Coage comes to Hamburg with them and then he departs to study and uh, to, to move to one of the great German universities and leaves Wordsworth and Dorothy in Goslar. Wordsworth is trying to learn German because he shared a facility for languages at university. He, uh, in as much as he had a special subject at university, it was Italian. He is uh, fluent in French and Italian. He tries to learn German so he can translate the kind of uh, Sturm und Drang novels of, of, of Germany at the time. But it doesn't work. And it's the coldest, snowiest, most freezing winter of the 18th century. And he 
and his sister end up locked down in Gosla. And Wordsworth feels like a, a failure because this great man, S.T. Coleridge, who after all is one of the most significant poets of the age, and Wordsworth knew as much, uh, he expected Co uh, Wordsworth to write in this great philosophical work, the, the Recluse, which would be a successor to Paradise Lost. And Wordsworth fails. He can't learn, he's finally learning German, learning German difficult. He, the locals don't trust him. They think that his sister is little more than his mistress, and he's failed in Coleridge's mission. So he picks up uh, what's known as a manuscript book, a notebook, in, uh, in Gosler in, in December in, in 1798, and he scribbles out these words, and it's from a sense of loss that he finds his true vocation, never mind philosophical masterpieces in the manner of Paradise Lost, talking about himself. So you can see the urgently written, I showed, uh, there was a manuscript uh, I showed you earlier on, where you see that Wordsworth is writing at enormous pace, and his handwriting is terrible, and he's fairly close to being blind by the time he turns 50. So let's have a look at the, the, opening, uh, the opening. So he's feeling, in this, uh, he's feeling despondent, he's feeling down, he's locked down, and it is in that moment, which I rather like to think about in our own experience of lockdown, that he finds his mature poetic voice in this model, not the plain simplicities in the inverted commas of the local ballads, but the blank verse maturity of the prelude. This, this is, these are the first lines of the two-part prelude of 1799, written in Gosler in isolation in 1788, 1798, beg your pardon. Was it for this that won the fairest of all rivers, and that is the Derwent at the back of the, at the, back of the house in Cockermouth. Was it for this that won the fairest of all rivers, loved to blend his murmurs with my nurse's song, and from his older shades and rocky falls, sent a voice that flowed along my dreams. For this didst thou, O Derwent, travelling over the green plains near my sweet birthplace, didst thou, beauteous stream, make ceaseless music through the night and day. Oh, many a time have I, a five years child, a naked boy, made one long bathing of a summer's day, basked in the sun and plunged and basked again, alternate or a summer's day, or coursed over the sandy fields, leaping through groves of yellow grunzel, or when crag and hill, the woods and distant Skiddaw's lofty height were bronze with a deep radiance, stood alone, beneath the sky, as if I had been born on Indian plains, and from my mother's hut had run abroad in wantonness to sport a naked savage in the, sh in the thunder shower. So this blank verse and little tonic register used in the service of talking about oneself, again, another contribution to Wordsworth, to the newness in Wordsworth's poetry. And you will see the preoccupation with childhood, which again is a new note in English poetry. The ch a child is father of the man, says Wordsworth in a somewhat, um, <laughs> somewhat sexist but brilliant short lyric called The Rainbow. My heart leaps up when I behold the rainbow in the sky. And he says, the child is father of the man. So again, a sense that childhood experience is at the core of poetry, whether his own or other people is again a new note in verse. John, that may be a good point actually, just to, uh, uh, slightly mindful of the time, but just to, to think, so we, you, you identified this, this moment, 1806, 1807, as one where uh, um, Wordsworth has uh, reached something of a, 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 a kind of literary peak. Um, he, he has demonstrated his uh, literary credentials, he's, he's produced, um, written, edited, uh, uh, and, and sort of claimed a new uh, kind of poetic voice. Yes. Um, I think as a way of sort of easing us towards the, you know, the, 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 the latter stages of our conversation, I'm wondering whether we could talk a little bit about how, uh, um, how his literary star then begins to uh, uh what kind of trajectory it follows after that you you've, you've mentioned already that that he was mocked by uh, uh others later in his career so but then equally he he became poet laureate so 
could you say a little bit about what 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 happens as as far as his kind of literary reputation is concerned in the the rest of his life through to uh, uh, his death? So Wordsworth is a conscious a conscious avant gardist. He's striking a new pose. He's saying new things. A hundred years and more later, T. E. Hume, T. S. Eliot, Ezra Pound will do a similar thing, repudiating Wordsworth and the Romantic tradition. Wordsworth is this young man who comes in and what does he do? He insults the entire last century of verse as stale poetic diction and here he is, he is doing something new. And it has to be said that there was quite a lot of nose thumbing of Wordsworth. Uh, you said in your introduction that I edited in 1999, Parodies of the Romantic Age, and in, eight, in 2003, British satire, 1785 to 1840. The most parodied, the most mocked, the most scoffed at, sneered at uh, uh, poet in the Romantic canon is Wordsworth. Now, Wordsworth is scoffed as a, as a, a simple, simple-minded idiot uh, in the first 20 years of his uh, poetic vacation, after the publication of The Excursion, a long blank verse um, narrative poem in 1814. He is then mocked for complexity and so on and then in the post-Napoleonic era he is mocked as a, a turncoat in Robert Browning's um, famous phrase. So Byron, and Shelley and Keats who are all deep Wordsworthians uh, mock him for various reasons. Okay so um, Wordsworth is a very contentious figure and not a figure whose work is unilaterally enjoyed and praised. So Lord Byron in the um, preface to the English Bard and Scotch reviewers, says that Wordsworth uses language not simple, but puerile. So infantile, who, you know, who cares about daffodils or birds' nests and so on? So Byron sees Wordsworth as a namby-pamby, namby-pamby, childish simpleton. The poet of childhood is actually a childish figure himself. So Lord Jeffrey, the editor of the... Uh, of the um, Edinburgh Review, politically sympathetic um, uh, um, po um, place for Wordsworth in 1808, but nonetheless says this, it is possible that the sight of a friend's garden spade or a sparrow's nest or a man gathering leeches might really have suggested such a minor train of powerful impressions and interesting reflection. But it is certain that to most minds, such associations will always appear false, strained and unnatural. We'll always have the air of ludicrous an affected singularity. Okay, so Wordsworth is seen as an affected, infantile, juvenile figure. He is, uh, there are people, De Quincey, Goldridge, others, who think, think of him as a, a game changer. Uh, but it takes a while. Let's have a look at the next slide, please. Okay, okay so Thomas De Quincey, living in Bath, just around the corner of where, where, where we're recording this, uh, this talk. Um, yeah, he's at Bath Grammar School and he comes across this volume of Lyrical Palette in 1798 as a young boy. And he is an admirer of Wordsworth from the start. But this is his take in 1835 when he's, uh, he's a slightly jaundiced eye or about Wordsworth for various reasons. But here we go. Up to 1820, the name of Wordsworth was trampled underfoot. From 1820 to 1830, it was militant after that from 1830 to 1835, it has been triumphant. At this day, no journalist will be taking up, which does not habitually speak of Mr. Wordsworth as a great poet, if not the great poet of the age. Wordsworth said himself in the uh, Prefer to Lyrical Ballads that every great poet creates the taste by which he is to be understood. So 30 years later, he is seen as a great poet. He is the first poet laureate appointed by Queen Victoria. He has honorary degrees from Durham in 1838, from Cambridge, in, uh, from Oxford, sorry, in, eight, in 1839. And he becomes a, an establishment, high establishment figure. And, and so, and of course he's still alive at this point. So yeah. you know, th this isn't a posthumous, uh, uh, recognition. So he, you know, he, he's there. He ha he has this alternative career that that means politically he he's moved away from from where he was uh, uh, as a young man. But but as his uh, um, 
his literary status rises and falls and then rises again, he is, he is there. And, and, uh, um, and this is partly because I'm queuing up the next slide, but, but there is a sense in, as he reaches his, his sort of final years, that he becomes more of a, uh, um, he sort of embraces that idea of being the great poet of the age. Yeah, the great, the great poet of the age and um, a person who tourists come to the Lake District and, and kind of look out for Wordsworth and come to, uh, come to Rydal Mount and um, kind of look in his garden, see if the great man's walking through composing one of his masterpieces. So yeah, he, he becomes a, 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 a canonised literary figure <laughs> before he before he dies, and uh, and has been ever since. Now the the, the history of Wordsworth's reputation, we could easily speak for ninety minutes about that, because Wordsworth has had a central figure. Where he had been a central figure in, in English Romanticism and in English poetry ever since. Harold Bloom, remember, says that he changes the nature of poetry at that um, at that um, Westminster Abbey event I mentioned, the Poet Laureate, our own dear Simon Armitage, says in a, in a kind of brilliant contemporary metaphor that Wordsworth pressed the reset button on English poetry, that he changed it entirely. From then, everything was different. And I think that is not overstated. I think that actually he, 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 he really was. Okay, so here is um, B.R. Hayden, who was... Um, an acquaintance of Wordsworth for many, many years. He writes, he, sorry, he, he paints brilliant portraits in, uh, in 1816 and again in 1842. So here is Wordsworth on Helvellyn and Wordsworth is 72 years of age and he um, climbed Helvellyn five or six years after this. So he was an extremely fit and remarkable man. I would, S.D. Courage is one of those people who, uh, of whom he said they, they didn't look after themselves. I mean, specifically, he was an alcoholic drug addict and uh, was lucky to get to the age of 62. But Wordsworth uh, lived to the ripe old age for those days of, of 80 and was still as agile in, 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 in well, almost as agile in, in, in his uh, old age as he was as a middle aged man. So, this is a, a very sublime portrait. Of Wordsworth, one of my favourite um, pictures of Hayden, sorry, of, of, of Wordsworth, um, painted shortly before Hayden did away with himself, rather, rather, rather sad and forlorn circumstances. Um, I wonder what then, as to just kind of wrap this up, and then we'll take a quick break and and, and get people to uh, ask some questions. But I, one of the things that I think um, has been most uh, 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 kind of notable about this conversation is the extent to which, uh, and it's almost a kind of paradox, on the one hand that you have this very close relationship between the, the poet's life and the poet's work, um, obviously in, in terms of the, the prelude, but also uh, in, in terms of the relationship he had with, particularly with Coleridge. Uh, um, but then also in the latter part, uh, you, you have this sort of, separation of the poet and the man and and you know this image which i mean maybe i'm 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 over reading it here but this image of 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 tourists flocking to be able to kind of peer through the gates to see the great man uh you know and will he be writing a sonnet today that that that's that you know on the one hand that that's that 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 shows his stature but it also kind of diminishes his stature in a way it 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 it, it makes him that that kind of postcard poet that that actually you know I think sometimes people can 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 uh, um, still fall into that trap of seeing Wordsworth in that way and that in some ways you know Byron's criticism or Jeffrey's criticism still you know still has some kind of resonance so as a kind of final uh, point before we go into the break um, wh what would you say is you know wh what makes him not only just important to us today, but 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 actually that we might risk forgetting in terms of uh, if we just think of the the, the kind of chocolate box uh, uh, romantic poet that uh, um, that we might be introduced to at kind of primary school. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, there are people who come to Lake District and go to Dove Cottage and then to um, the Beatrix Potter House and maybe look at a lake and, that, and well that's fair enough isn't it and we, we, we thoroughly approve of those people at, at, at Dove Cottage because at least they are 
you know, keep, at least they're keeping an interest of a kind into Wordsworth. But in terms of his inf influence on poetry, uh, can I answer that in a kind of slightly circuitous way by quoting Aldous Huxley? You don't normally think of Huxley as a, a kind of post romantic, but maybe, maybe later on in his career. But anyway, in, in 1930, he argues that, quote, we are all Wordsworthian now. And um, in a sense, I think that's still true in 2020. If, if we think of poetry as a way to express one's feelings, as a way to come to terms with episodes of loss or love or, um, or, or separation or longing or fear, then in a sense we're being Wordsworthy and almost by default without knowing it. When we think about poetry as engaged with nature, uh, again, we're Wordsworthy. Wordsworth's uh, most one of Wordsworth's most famous poem is a poem of loss and extension. Wordsworth is not a kind of braggart uh, who is um, uh, the, the egotistical sublime of Hazlitt and <laughs> Keats and Byron's imagination. He knows about loss and separation. That poem, uh, the Immortality Ode, how does it begin? There was a time when meadow, grove and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. But turn now, wheresoe'er I may, I may, by night or day, the things I once saw, I now can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. So a sense of lamentation and hard faultness in Wordsworth, that there, he's a tentative poet, a poet of loss. His poems about the deaths of three of his children are almost un 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 unread unreadably poignant and sad. John, I think that's, that takes us to 8.25. So I think uh, it might be a good point here to, to pause for about five minutes to allow people to uh, uh, have a stretch their legs, get themselves a cup of tea, uh, um, but if we return in in uh, uh, in about five minutes' time, and then uh, we can take some some questions from from the audience, and and then uh, uh, I know we've got a couple of poems that we skipped over, uh, including one of my favourites, uh, uh, Westminster Bridge. So I'm hoping that we will find time to be able to uh, 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 return to those. But we'll see what people, uh, um, what the audience would 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 like to to focus on. But just before we do that, um, one of these strange things about virtual online events is that uh, uh, one must imagine the standing ovation that one uh, has so rightly earned um, but uh, I'm very grateful to you for your uh, uh, um, remarkable kind of biographical uh, or a poet and biographical kind of uh, uh, um, perambulation which uh, uh, um, was all the more impressive given that the uh, the slides you ordered without necessarily knowing my question so uh, I thought that was very <laughs> impressive but um, if we could take uh, five minutes and uh, and then we'll return and, and we'll uh, um, see how what people talk of it. But thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Great questions. Are you uh, 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 are you good? To, um, you ready to be able to start taking uh, some some questions? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Great. So um, so this is where it, it, it could all uh, um, the kind of technical. Uh, 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 smoothness of the last 45 minutes or so could uh, all fall apart in the next <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, so the way that uh, I suggest that we do this, we, it depends how people, you know, what people prefer. Um, I'm happy to, uh, uh, for people to um, unmute their microphones and to uh, uh, um, introduce themselves and ask uh, a question. Uh, or they can, uh, um, if they want to uh, uh, take the slightly uh, more circuitous route, they can um, indicate their interest in asking a question in the chat and I can then call on them or Andreas can call on them uh, as he's in control of the uh, 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 technology behind the scenes at the moment. Um, so there may be, I'm going to ask uh, for, um, for questions and then uh, see see what happens and if we don't get anything you will be faced with two men staring at each other quite awkwardly. <laughs> oh, reading oh. Poetry. Okay we have a uh, um, 
a question from Amanda, uh, um, which she describes as a question going off a tangent, although uh, that is not uh, uh, um, not one that we uh, we always enjoy. Tangential questions are the best kind, um, uh, and uh, uh, um, and I uh, what. Uh, I'm trying to understand the question here. Oh, okay. I think uh, um, I think from what Amanda is saying here is is uh, this is uh, about the the way in which it take it can take a while for uh, literary figures to uh, um, you know, take take a good number of years before they get recognised canonically. Um, and uh, so I wonder. Uh, um, I mean, do you think Wordsworth has does he kind of provide a, a, a lesson to us? I mean, there is something I think quite poignant about him there in 1799 uh, in Goslar uh, and, you know, struggling as we all have been struggling with productivity. Um, you know, <laughs> none of us have, uh, or few of us have had a chance to uh, polish off that, uh, uh, that novel uh, in lockdown. So uh, is there something there about Wordsworth's, as it were, his, his struggles and his, his, uh, failures before he gets to be successful do you think there's something there that we can we can we can learn uh from him i absolutely do um it's a great question because if you think about many avant-garde modern forms in the last 20th in the last 200 years have kind of followed that wordsworthian template if you think about the various modernist manifestos what do they do they repudiate what goes before and a lot of it in term in the literary on the literary sense was wordsworthian uh, so if you think about Stravinsky and Schoenberg in art and Picasso and Brack, uh, sorry, in, uh, Stravinsky and Schoenberg in music, Picasso and Brack in art, they are creating the taste by which they are to be understood, to borrow, to, to borrow the Wordsworthian and Coleridge is, um, they're consciously avant-garde, they're doing something new, and can the great public of the world, of Europe, or whatever it might be, catch up with them? And in Wordsworth's case, it plainly, it plainly did by the 1830s when he is a doctor of civil letters and poet laureate and 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 so on and so on but it it takes a while uh wordsworth is very conscious of that there are many poetic manifestos that kind of are launched to great acclaim and controversy and never never really go anywhere if you think about the blast manifesto of, of of Wyndham lewis which is a remarkable piece piece of work whether it actually changed the criteria and the nature of the art form is is, is a, moot, a moot point but since words was quite often you have these manifestos of what poetry should be and words of course was not the first person to do it even in the, the romantic uh the, in the romantic period you know uh, in, in germany in the, in the in the decade uh in the decade before 1798 there are um romantic uh, noises and uh, soundings in German universities. So Wordsworth is participating in the spirit of the age in the terms of a romantic um, revolutionary, anti-enlightenment, uh, anti, um, uh, new force in art, in literature, in art and music. I hope that uh, <laughs> answers, your, answers your question. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe, you switched on your video. It was that a sign that you wanted to, to ask a question? Oh, yeah. No, I just imagine we'd all be switching on our videos, but it appears on the only one. So. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, um, it's nice uh, we, we, we have a question from uh, 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 Richard, who, if his name, uh, uh, I suspect, maybe one of our colleagues. Um, and it's a question here about Wordsworth and Victorian cities, um, you know, we think of Wordsworth so much as a, a poet of, 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 uh, um, of nature, but he's writing at, at, during the Rust Industrial Revolution. I mean, as uh, you know, Blake uh, uh, perhaps most famously engages with that, uh, um, the, 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 the impact of industrialization and urbanization. So um, what, how is Wordsworth a, an urban poet or is he, does he sort of, uh, um, see it in a uh, only through a kind of uh, um, a lost world that uh, you know a, a sort of anti-nature well Wordsworth spent a fair amount of his life in London uh, both he, as did S.T. Courage who was educated at Christ Hospital which in those days was in uh, was in London in the city city of London and 
Did he have a love-hate relationship with London? That's, that's a very good question. He couldn't, he quite often couldn't wait to kind of dash down there and spend several weeks in, in, in London. I mean, there is, a, there is a romantic conceit, which is that the, um, the, the voice of poetry is rural, it's provincial, it is not exalted, it's not talking about kings and queens and millords and, 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 and so on. And in the 1805 version of the prelude, where there's talks about uh, being delivered from yonder city pent, which of course is uh, a Miltonic, a Miltonic e e echo. So there is a, a tendency in Wordsworth to kind of demonize the, the city in the Bartholomew Fair uh, section of the, the, the 1805 prelude. He's talking about an, an almost kind of satanic uh, carnivalesque force in city low life enter entertainments and so on. But at the same time, he is also capable of great and sublime poetry about London. And that poem, we, I hope we'll have time to come back to before we close. The uh, sonnet composed on Westminster Bridge is about London and the beauty of London and the way in which the natural world can encompass the city as well. So it's a kind of, it's, it's a mixed picture. Sometimes London is demonized. Sometimes London is celebrated and nature itself can reach into the very heart of the great metropolis, the biggest city on earth in 1802. Um, that, the, there's a question here from Lucy, another colleague, I, I think from Bus Bar, um, which follows on quite nicely from that, which is about um, eco poetics and Wordsworth as 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 as, a, as an early eco poet, um, and the question is what words what can Wordsworth's version of sublime nature teach us about how we can protect uh, and value our natural world now? Is his environmental perspective helpful in what's really needed right now in this time of climate crisis? Yes, indeed. I think I'm going to I'm going to answer that question myself. I really value if she's still still around, Professor Rigby's take on this as a romanticist with a, a, and professor of environmental humanities. Now, uh, in nineteen in the nineteen eighties, when I first started reading Wordsworth, his opposition to extending the 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 um, railway from Windermere up to Grasmere was seen as the act of a rather snooty uh, upper middle class person who didn't want the oiks from Manchester and, and Blackpool coming in and in, in, into the Lake District. Now, 30 years later, we think of that as slightly different manoeuvre. And uh, there were significant works in the 1990s which claimed Wordsworth for a kind of green ecology. Uh, the most significant is, I think it's 1991, book by the aforesaid Jonathan Bate, uh, which was uh, about the green Wordsworth, Wordsworth and the ecological movement. There's no doubt that Wordsworth was a great um, inspiring force behind Canon Rawlsley and the development of the National Trust. Uh, the Wordsworth Trust and the National Trust come from the same man, the same move of kind of post-Wordsworthian late 19th century uh, ways in which how do we protect the environment. Wordsworth is an environmentalist. Sometimes some of his causes like uh, trying to ban larches from the Lake District uh, seem quite quixotic, but uh, his heart was certainly in, in the right place. Maybe, maybe, would you like to come in on that one, Kate? Hi, whoops, hello. <laughs> I've got my uh, camera in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the thank you for the question, um, Lucy. And um, yeah, I, I very much agree with John. Um, I think there is much of continuing value within Wordsworth for um, an ecological uh, ethic. Um, and um, I guess I would add to that a kind of um, underlying. Um, um, ethos or mode of comportment in, in relation to um, the world, which um, I've described as a, as a contemplative uh, way of being. And it's about being really respectful and mindful um, of the, the, the life of other things and seeking to create um, human ways of living, um, human cultural forms that sustain the flourishing of more than human life. Um, so yeah, I, I I I really do believe that that um, that Wordsworth remains a really significant 
um, figure in our moment of profound crisis and peril. So thank you. Okay, uh, uh, I should have jumped in earlier. You should introduce yourself because uh, there was a reason why John brought you in uh, on that particular point. Um, okay, thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm the director of Bath Spa's Research Centre for Environmental Humanities um, and also director of our Masters in Environmental Humanities. And I've actually just published a book um, on uh, called Reclaiming Romanticism Towards Neco Poetics of Decolonization, which brings uh, romantic writers, including Wordsworth, into conversation with modern and contemporary poets, including African American and Australian Aboriginal poets. Um, and I argue that there is a kind of um, a decolonizing moment uh, within um, the Romantic Revolution, including in the work of, of Wordsworth. So it's, uh, I've been spending a lot of time with Wordsworth and, and others <laughs> in recent years. That, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. John, did you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I, I would. You know, Wordsworth says in Tintin Abbey, we see into the light of things. He's not an exclusively human vision, me, Wordsworth. Mm -hmm and uh, he sees the landscape and the animals which populate the landscape as forms worthy of respect uh, in, a, in, in a way that seems quite modern you know, to, to, uh, in the 21st century. Thank you, Kate, thank you. Um, just as a, another way of thinking about the, oh, Daisy, I, I saw you, you had your hand up there, very tentative, but uh, uh, Daisy, do you want to... Uh, uh, yeah, if that's all right, I don't want to interrupt if you have something no, no, <laughs> to say. No, I, I, no, your question will be much more interesting than mine, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I just have a quick point of curiosity. Uh, so you said in response to someone else's question that Wordsworth's quite revolutionary romantic style and uh, romanticism more broadly was a reaction to Enlightenment ideas. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you believe that Wordsworth and his peers would have risen or would have even had their work accepted in a pre-Enlightenment age? Probably not. I mean, we, we, we can overdo the anti-Enlightenment sense of Wordsworth because he says, he says no, man can be a po no man can be a poet who has not thought long, hard and deeply. So you can overdo the anti-rationalism part of, of romanticism. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a position, you know, that um, Blake says that I will not be a silly slave of Rome. In other words, <laughs> to hell with, with Homer and Ovid and, and Virgil and so on. But of course, everyone knows that you are dependent on, on, on that tradition. So Words, Wordsworth, of course, repudiated a certain form of what he saw as doctrinaire rationalism, but also at the same time, think about it, think, think about that poem, for oft when in my, in Oxford, often on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood. And he doesn't mean pensive, like all frightened and, and feeling a bit alone. He means thoughtful. So thought is really important, uh, he says in, in, in romantic thought. It's only in the, when you get into a kind of uh, high romantic art for art's sake, as particularly in France in the 1840s and 1850s, and, and maybe even later in England, maybe in Swinburne and so on, where you'd kind of ditch the rationalist inheritance. It's, it's there. Wordsworth says that, that the imagination is a wondrous interchange of matters from within and from without. So it's not purely expressive. It's the intercourse between the, the mind's eye and that which is out there. So. It is a reductive uh, argument to say that, oh, here they are, they blew you know, the Enlightenment out of the water. Well, <laughs> to a certain extent, they sounded off about doing so. But of course, you cannot escape. I mean, you know, all, of the, all, all of the attacks on, I don't know, Sir Isaac Newton by, by Blake and so on, they're, they're conscious iconoclasm, but at the same time, romanticism is really dependent on the, the Enlightenment. And as you say, it <laughs> wouldn't be much of a corpus with, without it. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Joe. I thought I thought of a question now after uh, putting my image up to start with. So first of all, uh, yeah, well, first of all, John, thank you for a terrific talk. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, and really interesting as well. I just want to ask you about John Clare. Yeah. I've always had a soft spot for him. And do we know much about you know, what Wordsworth thought of him? And in a sense, was John Clare the sort of the authentic um thing that wordsworth was trying to be the authentic peasant voice um you know that as, as a rural poet well it's a good question uh, uh, Claire, fans of john Clare certainly 
tend to elevate their hero by slightly slagging off Wordsworth, as, who after all was this Cambridge educated public school boy who, because there is a take on Wordsworth that he's just, um, what's the word, he's empire building within, within, amongst the common people, right? And of course, to a certain extent, it certainly was. I mean, I, I, I love Claire's poetry. Uh, I think that it's slightly different from Wordsworth in as much as it's less theorized, there's less kind of, there's less kind of, put, uh, what's the word? There's, there's less uh, kind of self-consciously reflecting on the process of poetry that you get in, in Claire. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, my, my appetites are, are, are wide enough to have, uh, have Claire. And of course, Keats and Byron, who spent a lot of their time slagging off Wordsworth uh, while busily <laughs> stealing his clothes. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, Claire is, Claire is a great and considerable working class poet. But there were working class poets before Wordsworth. And of course, uh, you could argue if you were a fan of, of, of Robert Burns, that what he and Coleridge were doing was something that Robert Burns did 10 years previously in, in 1787 in the Kilmarnock edition. But well, after all, he's talking about the experience of the rural poor. It's using the traditional ballad meter with cross rhyme. It's talking about, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of having black comedy and uh, in, in a similar way to the lyrical ballads. So yeah, you can overstate the, uh, the, the total newness of Wordsworth. I mean, the, the, it's a re that's what poetic avant-garde movements do. They imply that they are ground zero, you know, and everything before, everything before that was a lot of rubbish. Well, of course you can go back into 18th century uh, poetry and you can find uh, self-reflective verse. You can find poetry about the sublimity of nature in Thompson's The Seasons, for example. You can see anticipations of Wordsworth and others in Young's night thoughts and so on. So they're not without antecedents. No, anti no artistic movement comes out of, of, of a vacuum. And Clare is a very great poet. And yeah, it's perfectly possible to make an argument that he was more genuine. But Mark Clare was, Clare was in as much as he was a success early in the 1820s, was marketed as the peasant poet because there is a there is this convention post Burns that you can make lots of money from <laughs> selling selling these authentic you know unmediated uh, working class experience. So after Byrne dies, there is a, ser ser a series of poets who come in his wake who are from humble roots. James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, Robert Bloomfield, and eventually the greatest of them all, John Clare. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's really you got very good taste. Yeah. God, I just wonder, given we've only got a few minutes left, it might be uh, a moment to return to those two poems that you didn't uh, uh, um, you didn't get to to talk about earlier. Um, and uh, um, I'm uh, uh, hoping that Andreas can can give me back. There we go. Uh, control of the uh, screen, so I can go back. And which would you prefer first, the Westminster Bridge? Westminster or? Bridge, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's do Westminster Bridge. So I'm going to flick back. It's going to take a few uh, moments to get back. Um, so do you want to queue up Westminster Bridge okay. while we get? This is this is written in, in 1802, and it's a poem of the city. You know, words just the great rabidly kind of anti-metropolitan poet. Well, he, he, here we are, uh, and, and he rather problematizes that notion. And of course. Um, there are certain works of romanticism which you reinterpret in the, via the kind of um, the knowledge of lockdown. So Charles Lamb's superannuated man about the closure of London on a Sunday uh, is so it reads differently under lockdown. And as does this poem about quietude. I mean, walking in Bath uh, where, dear God, the very shops <laughs> seem asleep over the last few weeks. So this is Wordsworth's great sonnet of 1802. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theatres and temples lie open unto the field and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour, valley, rock or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, 
their very houses seem asleep and all that mighty heart is lying still. It's a beautiful poem. Uh, yeah. And uh, um, if, if we had more time, I would have, uh, I, I think there's some wonderful paradoxes there about the, the city, um, the way in which the, the, he, he, he uh, um, captures a sit, the city absent of people. And, and that, that sort of sense in which we are the, the uh, um, uh, as you said, it, 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 it's so uh, um, poignant now as we uh, emerge from lockdown and uh, uh, have, have been in, um, seeing Bath and other cities in, in much the same uh, uh, kind of way um, without, without the people. Um, shall we end with uh, uh, your uh, valedictory sonnet? Well, not yours, but but uh, uh, okay. I mean, Wordsworth. And just think about what it, the the implication of that first line: Earth has not anything to show more fair. Never mind Grasmere and Helvellyn and um, the River Derwent. Okay, so uh, there's a collection of poems uh, um, uh, on the subject of the. The River Duddon, which is in the South Lakes on the border of Lancashire and what is now Cumbria. And this is a very, very fine um, uh, sonnet sequence. And this poem gives the lie to Wordsworth being an extinct volcano after 1807. There are moments where the flames lift, uh, lift, lift, light up in a most remarkable way. And this is a, a, a brilliant way to, uh, to, to conclude matters. Thee is the river. I thought of thee, my partner and my guide, as being passed away. Vain sympathies. For backward, Dutton, as I cast my eyes, I see what was and is and will abide. Still glides the stream and shall forever glide. The form remains, the function never dies. While we, the brave, the mighty and the wise, we men who in our morn of youth defied the elements must vanish be it so enough is something from our hands have power to live and act and serve the future hour and if and if as towards the silent tomb we go through love through hope and faith's transcendent dower we feel that we are greater than we know Thank you, John. That was a, a, a lovely way to end this conversation. And uh, all I have left to say is to uh, thank everybody for, for joining us this evening, uh, uh, for, for, you for, for staying with us and uh, for providing excellent questions. Uh, to thank Andreas for uh, um, guiding us behind the, uh, the scenes. And of course, to thank John for uh, something of a tour de force uh, over the last uh, um, 90 minutes or so. Um, thank you again for uh, supporting Brisley during um, this very difficult uh, period for uh, the organisation. It's great that we are able to use virtual technology to support the, uh, uh, the kinds of activities that Brisley has been supporting for so many years. Uh, and we very much look forward to returning to Queen Square in, in due course uh, as as uh, as necessary so uh, um, thank you again all uh, we will uh, uh, end the the recording now and let people return to their their Monday evenings but thank you again for for your time and attention thank you thank you, thank you everybody bye-bye